Welcome to Money Mondays, powered by the Joseph Business School, where we bring you up-to-date money news for your personal finances and businesses. I'm your host, Jill Thompson. To inspire hope, we are discussing changing the face of poverty and rebuilding communities. We have with us today, James T. Smith, the founder of a multi-million dollar not-for-profit called So Community Development Corporation. James Smith, a retired United States Army OEF and OIF veteran, is passionate about working to foster growth in communities. He's a natural entrepreneur with the heart of a teacher. James stands as a beacon of hope and inspiration for those hardest hit by crime, violence, and unemployment. His extensive organizational leadership has grown so as OW from a startup in 2014 to a certified business development entity and a 501c3 organization with over 100 properties. So has purchased over 75 properties and redeveloped and sold 25 properties within the last two years. Motivated by their progress? I am. But wait, there's more. So established REAP Capital Partners in 2018, an Opportunity Zone Fund to access large-scale capital to spur community asset-based development. Most recently, So received its certification as a community development entity from the CDFI Fund of the U.S. Department of Treasury. Its goal is to elevate underprivileged communities ravaged by unemployment, gun violence, rampant crime, and fractured families. He believes we can accomplish this together. Money Monday audience, let's welcome James T. Smith to the podcast. Wow, this is absolutely amazing and you have achieved so much in such a short period of time. James, can you tell us your story? Well, I grew up on the west side of Chicago. My mother was a teacher, she's retired. My father was a police officer, one of the founding members of the Afro-American Patrolman's League in Chicago. And he's deceased. Uh, I went to Resurrection Grammar School and graduated from Whitney Young, went away for a year of college, was messing up, went into the Air Force, uh, came to a knowledge of my salvation. I had gone in church for quite some time, but I came to a knowledge of salvation in the barracks at Luke Air Force Base in Glendale, Arizona. I began to work with the ministry of a pastor that had been a retired uh, master sergeant. Uh, Lee Montague, one of my favorite people in the world. Uh, and we raised money to take children from South Phoenix or inner city Phoenix to camp for two weeks a year. So there I got into the ministry. So when I got out of the Air Force the first time in, in 88, I still stayed in and did some reserve time, but I did youth ministry. And I did youth ministry for about 20 years. Uh, I also went back to California and go going to Bible school and all of that. And uh, ended up working with E.B. E. Hill and got to meet Billy Graham. Him and Pastor, Pastor Hill were just a, a phenomenal piece, a, a phenomenal relationship in that I got to walk through South Central LA and share the gospel door to door. And that was an experience. I really enjoyed it. God taught me a lot through that. Can you tell us about So and how you got started? I had a best friend and uh, he was supposed to be kind of running So and to come in and do community development because we had to develop the institutions that are key here. What I ended up doing was when I was coming or retiring from the army, from the Army. I started so in October 2014 and then began to uh, plan. When I got out in 2016, I began to work. Uh, so the planning was done in between 14 and 16 and then began to work. Uh, various certifications have come along the way. Uh, certified with the City of Chicago as a residential, uh, residential housing developer and uh, then before that, we were, we were certified with Treasury, uh, the CDFI fund, which can be a either for-profit or not-for-profit certified as a community development entity, which allows an individual to have access to new market tax credits and various other uh, investments from the Treasury and grants from Treasury that, that literally 
are designed for affordable housing. There's one coming up now, the, the uh, Capital Magnet Fund, uh, which is due this week. So you can you can borrow or or they'll invest five hundred thousand to twenty nine million in your organization as long as you're working on affordable housing. So those are some 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 things that you have to look at. And then I had to find experts, and I didn't have to look too hard because God kept bringing them in into the doors. Uh, so so has become a a multi-million dollar organization and, and we're looking at about we founded REAP as a opportunity zone fund and the goal is to get to about 250 million within the next two months uh, with regards to do investments uh, because we have what we call shovel ready projects of uh, commercial and multi-unit housing in in Fontana and Rialto California uh, also in Pensacola, we have a couple other projects. We have some projects here in Chicago or the Chicagoland area. We have some projects in Kankakee and so on, so on, so on. So it's the Lord just opened up and people that gravitated to us that didn't mind working stayed with me. Uh, I didn't ask anybody to follow me. The Lord just brought them along the way. And I'm not going to throw anybody away because... God gave it to me. I can share it with everybody else and show them how to do it so that we can, we can build out America, if you will. That's excellent. Another question. Can you talk about ownership? I know you mentioned uh, the topic of ownership about owning our communities and rebuilding and reinvesting within our communities. And you even gave the example of the young lady who owns the grocery store. Can you talk about ownership? America, you used to not be able to vote if you didn't own property. Uh, the, the, the wealthiest people in our, in, in our nation are those that provide a service or a product or have developed a product, product or invented something and produce. Or for the normal person, the, the, the closest you can get to owning a bank is owning your own house. Uh, mm. So... When, when, we, when we look at people that don't have bank accounts and can't move around in the cash stations, those are those money changers that the Bible speaks of, of stealing people's money at the, at the temple. And the banks, eh, I don't want to say anything negative because I don't want to lose my stuff at the bank. But what we look at is your house is the largest purchase of most people's lives. And so what it does is it affords you the ability to have something to pass down to your children. When you rent, you literally pay for that house twice if you live in that apartment or that house that you've been renting for 30 years. You pay for it twice as opposed to paying for it once or half of, about half, 60%, 50% of what you've been spending on your rental you put that in that house, and then at the end of that 30 years or at the end of 10 years or 15 years, depending on how long your mortgage is, you are able to actually refinance or sell it and move someplace else, and it's a retirement fund. So it doesn't matter if the, the police pension is gone or the city's pension is gone or the teacher's pension is gone. It's about in your house. You own that land. You can always go out in the backyard, grow you some grow you some uh, uh, carrots and tomatoes and, and pickles or whatever, and get you a couple of chickens over on, uh, on, on, on uh, Kedzie and, and, and Carol. My grandfather and them moved there from, from Cabrini before they built the projects. And there's our next door neighbor even has pigs. They have pigs and goats and chickens and, and, and grow all kinds of greens and, 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 and other vegetables so that they don't necessarily have to move anywhere. You got your food, you got your clothing. If you, if you raise sheep, you could shear your own wool. So it, 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 you wanna own your own property. It, it's a very expedient and it's a very uh, good sign of stewardship. You don't have to wait to be rich. You're putting your money in and it's, it's increasing in value. That's good. James. 
Another thing you mentioned is that you came here with $100 and I think it's uh, uh, amazing. I really want you to touch a bit on it a bit more. The reason why is because for those who are watching our Money Monday audience, we oftentimes hear our pastor, Dr. Winston, say he started with just $200. And so for you to tell us a story that you came here with $100, can you talk about where you were then and where you are now and how God has guided you along this journey where you've gone from sowing, no pun intended, to reaping. The community has gone from to the reaping. But well, I got out and I I bought a sixty thousand dollar building with the help of my mom, and I lost that building because it was a development company, and there were some people that saw me as the straight man, and they used that's an old phrase but they used me to help grift money from other folks and trying to keep my for-profit business going and building. I lost probably about $200,000. And then I came back over to where I am with Mount Zion, excuse me, Mount Zion, <laughs> Mount Vernon with Pastor uh, Miller. And we began to just talk about it. And he said, go on boy. And so he just gave me a little space here. Uh, started the non the nonprofit was already started. I kept all of the things going. My my general contracting company is still up and going. We're still using it to rehab some of the houses ourselves, as some of the houses are primarily done by my developers. What what we kind of like to, I'm sorry, I'm what we kind of like to do like if somebody has a background or whatever, I can give them a house that they're going to have to pay for ultimately, but. They can put the work in in the house. They can have a house that they can live in. We'll put it in their name and they'll just, we'll set a price for them. They'll just pay that price. And then we'll take that and use the money again and do it over. Uh, we've done that a few times, but I just don't I, don't, I I won't share the person's name or the property that we used it on, but if they want to talk about it, we do let them talk about it. But uh, it, it, it was the, there was a gentleman, um, Mark, and Mark found out we got the certified to do these properties through F with Fannie and Freddie. And Mark said, James, this is how you do it. And Mark was a shark. Mark helped me from October through uh, Dr. King, where we celebrate Dr. King's birthday when he died. Um, we had talked the day before. He talked to me every day. This white guy just, guy just put him in my life and showed me how to do some of this stuff. And then I had to learn the rest. And then the people that had been working with him didn't want to work with his partner. So one guy, Ken, came looking for me at my house, which is where my, my place used to be, uh, uh, my, my, my business used to be certified at. And now we're over here. Uh, and he came looking for me at the house, trying to have a meeting with me. And he's been a great help. God has used him to, to kind of support us as a developer so that we could go to get that $2 million. And now eh, the amount of money that we're going after is uh, a couple hundred right now, a couple hundred million right now. But again, that's not any money, literally, because Treasury, Treasury has undergirded community development at a point where we can take it and manifest work to build our community the way I would argue that God designed for it to, to be built. So James, what is the best method for a community-based nonprofit economic development approach for the acquisition of REOs and targeted MSAs? Especially okay. opportunity and enterprise zones hardly, hardest hit by foreclosures. Yeah, there are 28 markets that was hard by foreclosure. The uh, National Community Stabilization Trust, which is who, how we used it first, and they're moving out of that business because Fannie took over and developed their own website. HUD moved out a long time ago. HUD's houses, uh, they take a lot more work than everybody else, but Fannie has a lot with regards to the Chicago area or the Chicago MSA or Metropolitan Statistical Area which has to do with, we have 50,000, it's a large metro and we're connected to this. It goes all the way down into South, Northeast, Northwest Indiana and Southeast 
Wisconsin all the way out towards Rockford and all the way down towards Kankakee. And so they would get roughly 2,000 uh, REOs in that area per year that are foreclosed on. Now they used to have more. Uh, it's kind of stabilized, but I imagine with this pandemic and everything else that's going on, we'll probably get some more into there, into some uh, more REOs into the uh, population of things that we, 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 we attack. But they ha even with the 25,000 that they've done over the past six years, it still hasn't changed those communities because typically you have somebody from the outside coming in, grabbing the REO, making the money and leaving. Mm. My goal was not to focus on me becoming a millionaire because if I had, I could have done that already. What, what my focus was, was to go ahead and build a bucket, as a friend of mine would say, that we could begin to fill so that we can use and do the REOs ourselves so that as we become, because we're licensed in the city of Chicago as a, as a residential uh, real estate developer. And so to begin to develop our own community, Fannie and Freddie have this item called duty to serve. And their statement is that manufactured housing or modular homes, not mobile homes, but modular homes, uh, which we can make look just like every block, every house on your block, it, it is one of the easiest ways or, or the, 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 the most prom promising ways to create uh, an engine for an individual family. A lot of people rent in our community because we have a lot of absentee landlords. And so I think we have like 70% of rental on the West side, which is, you, you can't, a community can't thrive with that. You have to own it because it's like having a piggy bank. You save almost half of what you pay in rent by owning your own home. So that's part of our exit strategy. So we have to begin to teach and then we have to have enough capital in order to reinvest in the community and be intentional about it. One of the biggest things is going to be the manufactured housing. The manufactured housing will save 20 to 40% on the purchase of a house, which makes it affordable. And then the fact that I'm not, I'm focusing on developing more houses. I'd rather get a thousand houses that we, we, we I get a thousand dollars from each house that we build up to a thousand houses, as opposed to $10,000 on 10 houses or $10,000 on a hundred houses, because we just are able to do more and we can change community. There's 19,000 vacant lots that the city owns and probably another 17 to 19,000 that are privately owned on the south and the west side. If you look at that map, it just, it, it, it's disheartening. Uh, the, 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 the shootings that we had this weekend, the little kids, that, the little boy that died and the little girl that died, what would it be if we had created for their families, for their, for their parents, the ability to work and make $25 an hour, $40 an hour, which is doable. But what I see is the whole problem. When we look at unions, uh, the Davis-Bacon Act of 1931 was written so that they would stop black people from being laborers when they had built the country before, but they wanted to bring people over from another place and grab these jobs. Poor white folks couldn't get a job because we were the experts. And so they wrote us out of it. And so Chicago and other places like us are still suffering from the fact that union jobs are good. But in this development that we're doing, we can't afford to pay $90 an hour to somebody and then provide a product that is very affordable for, for, for somebody that's making 30 or $40,000 a year. And that's mm -hmm. our gold market to be able to, for every hundred thousand dollars you spend on a mortgage, it's roughly five hundred and eighty, five hundred and ninety dollars a month in in a mortgage. Excuse me, rent for purchase, but in rental you're you're still talking about twelve to fifteen hundred dollars a month, and you still got roaches. And wow. so we can we can do better than that, and we have done better than that. And so how does so go about acquiring pools of non-performing mortgages to help community revitalization by MSAs with the purpose of pool mitigation of all note, mitigating all note? Yes, ma'am. That's our main goal to be able to get to that point where we can spend that billion dollars, which is really not a lot of money. Uh, 
we could spend that billion dollars and buy a thousand non-performing notes or whatever it, the price is. They just had a sale. Fannie just had a sale right as the pandemic was hitting. It came up and I, I didn't follow it because I'm not in that position right now where we could spend a billion dollars or we're close to being able to borrow a billion dollars, but we're not close to being able to really manage the non-performing notes. We're trying to grab hold of the REOs and then the infill housing, which would be uh, filling in some of the six or 7,000 vacant lots that we have on the west side. Wow. Uh, well, we do south side too, but that, that's our main focus. So you, we got to make sure we take care of home. Even a good man feeds his family first. Yeah. And so we got to make sure home is done. And as we do home, we'll spread around. And my, my teaching uh, through evangelism and door to door in South Central, door to door on the West Side, youth ministry, all that kind of stuff says that if I'm, I'm 55 now. If I'm 85 and I'm still running a youth program, I failed because I didn't develop any leadership. And so let's stay in that and talking about your development with REO properties. So the HUD Neighborhood Stabilization Program was originally funded with 50 million grant operated as part of the CDBG. Um, how can so access a line of credit for acquisition and rehab of REOs and non-performing no remedi remediation of those pooled properties. That's like an onion, okay? You cry miserably trying to get through all of that. And, and really, while HUD has a FHA is part of HUD, so I think it's, I wanna say it's 1.6 trillion or 6 trillion or something like that. Some with a T, a lot of money. Okay. And, and part of it is, is that Section 8 vouchers can be used to purchase a home, period. So what we need, what I would say when we're dealing with HUD or FHA, we need to be looking at an end exit strategy, whether it's them giving low income housing tax credits so that that individual can purchase the house. It used to be where we had project based, man, I can't believe I remember all of this stuff that I just learned. We had project based uh, programs with regards to development so that the developer would get the, 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 the money to help develop this little housing. So it's all kind of in there and it's a lot of tape. And part of it is you just have to stick to it and it doesn't make sense. It's not comfortable. You, you're, you're wondering, you say, oh, I didn't know that. And there's so much to learn. But for me, I'd set that over on the side. What we have is new market tax credits. New market tax credits come out of the treasury with the community development financial institution side of that, which is designed, uh, what was that, 97, I think it was, that they came up with the CDFI. Don't, don't quote me on that, you can look it up. But it, it, it affords a developer to spend, if you're developing a commercial building or mixed use uh, multi-unit, you can take 39% of that and you get that money and it'll be forgiven, but somebody else is gonna buy the tax burden from you and they'll be able to use it for seven years and it'll relieve. It's a lot, 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 lot to unfold in that. So I've had to access accountants and lawyers and- Oh, I'm sure, yeah. And, and, and the Lord has just, I had, I had a little more than a hundred because I was retired but I was retired and had a hundred bucks that we put into so and January of 18 and, and God look just is today. opened up just some stuff. And I'm like, wow, God is sovereign. And the message that I have been learning over those, over these past 55 years has been James, stop trying to follow a human being. Follow me. Oftentimes people ask me, are you a millionaire? How much money you got? it's it's just it, paul said I, I i i know how to be poor and i know how to be rich i know how to to be hungry and i know how to be fed my hunger time probably came more so in the military and sometimes being at war but the reality is is that like in roman excuse me matthew 6 where he talks about man the birds didn't sow nor did they reap they didn't get any silk. They didn't make that silk to fix their nest with, but they have 
food and, and shelter. And then even Solomon was not clothed as well as those lilies of the field that, that are going to be burned and thrown into the fire. Oh, man, dude, come on. Shut up. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. So I don't seek money. I seek his righteousness. I seek to do as he said in uh, Romans, excuse me, Romans, 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 not Romans, Matthew 28, where he, excuse me, 25, where he talks about, I'm going to separate the sheep from the goat. Lord, how, how am I, what's a sheep from the goat? I'm not a sheep, I'm a human. He said, look, if you feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit those that are sick and imprisoned. Yes. For me, I know money as a tool. I realized that food, clothing, and shelter are what my children need, what I need, what my next door neighbors need, what my, 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 that, that bum down the street, if, excuse me, I'm supposed to say uh, transient individual down the street. That's my GI Joe talking. So as we, as we move forward, the church has to understand and remember that when Priscilla, Aquila, and Paul, notice I did mention the woman first, uh, 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 got into money troubles because they weren't getting money from Galatia or somebody, and they made tents. So they built houses. Mm. We need to be in the business of building houses and taking care of the poor. When we take care of the poor, the Lord take care of us. Yes. And that's why I do this. I think that those words that you just gave are, key, are an important key to understanding the wisdom of God and that in this season, partnership is more than ever uh, needed, primarily in the kingdom as we begin to advance and take territory to do God's will, as you said, to feed the needy, to clothe those who need clothing to provide shelter as he said in Matthew 25 when I didn't have shelter or when I was sick did you come see me when I was in prison did you visit me and so I am grateful that we could actually take an opportunity to speak with someone of your caliber where you're so humble and you're like hey the information that I've received I've received freely and I'm more than willing to share what it is that I have in order to help our communities begin to develop and thrive in this season and so if there's one other thing that you could possibly tell our Money Monday audience, I know you touched a bit about ownership. And I think that we need more people to tell us about why we should own it. And I like how you gave the example with uh, Equilla and Priscilla about don't sell the house. Now you got it, don't sell it. And so can you just talk a little bit more to our audience before we close out our segment? Because I believe that there is an anointing and a grace that's on you to help people develop a mindset of ownership and wanting to see better for their communities and the places in which they live. Yes, ma'am. So, so one big thing that I had to learn about myself is that I started this with the goal of raising $2 million so that we could develop the 4,200 block of West Adams, which dealt with nine, 19 properties or so. Portion of them were for uh, vacant buildings. Another portion of them were vacant lots, do infill housing and take care of that. When I started working with the folks with the Opportunity Zone, they said, man, you put together a nice video. That was great. And I'm like, yeah, okay. So all we're trying to do is raise $2 million. They said, that's not enough. So then I took the whole census track, which happened to be, happened. It just, we got lucky. <laughs> no, the Lord. Costner to Keeler, Madison to Congress. 142 vacant lots and 58 vacant structures, with two of them being the schools, Melody and uh, Goldblatt. Uh, roughly $50 million to redevelop. And I'm like, got my chest out. I said, bro, look, this is what we looked at. Here are the pin numbers and all of that, and we can put this together. He said, bro, that ain't big enough. So then I went and talked with some bigger thinking individuals, and he said, man, the city of Chicago got 15,000, it's really 19,000, vacant lots that it owns on the south and the west side. So what I, I, I think you should do is do some infill. He said, make 1,250 single family, 1,250 duplexes, 1,250 three flats, and 1,250 six-unit apartment buildings. 
I said, okay. Then we sat down to get his numbers and it added up to $4.8 billion with a B. And I said, And I realized at that point that I had to give myself permission to ask God for what we needed as mm -hmm. opposed to what I thought I could get. Wow. A Yugo will get me from point A to point B. A bicycle will get me to point A to point B. But in order to spend time with my children I, I, I'm divorced, so I got one kid over here, one kid over there, and uh, I got to move around. The bicycle just won't do. And a Yugo, I might fall, put through the floor and, and get it. So the Lord just blessed me with a, another car. The Lord blessed me with the ability to eat and, and, and all of these other things because I said, yes, Lord, I'm listening. He said, then stop asking for just enough of what you think you can get from me or what you think you deserve. You don't deserve nothing, but God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And one of my favorites one is Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech and night unto night showeth knowledge. There's no speech, no language where their voice is not heard. Them people that act. What about if I didn't have no Bible, I couldn't read, and I couldn't see? Well, the Lord makes it easier for them because they have to depend on him and talk to him on a regular basis. You don't need the Bible to, 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 to get saved. You just got to honor how God created us and worship the creator, not the creature. And so the Lord showed me that all I was doing was asking for enough. Or, 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 or just enough as opposed to so that we could thrive and then when somebody else came along that needed something I could give to them I was going to say trust the Lord with all thine heart lean not unto thine own understandings and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path great peace have those who love your law and nothing shall make you stumble and the Lord man I, God is sovereign is not a trivial phrase for me. I've seen the biggest bomb that you ever, never wanted to see. And all y'all popping in fireworks around my house, stop. <laughs> well, there you have it, Money Monday audience. Mr. Smith, thank you. And so for coming onto our podcast today and for the work that you're doing within our communities. It's truly a blessing. And what I believe it's more of a blessing is that it's, a, it's, it's an example and you are a witness to God is no respecter of any persons, that what he can do for you, he can do for the next person as well. And we just wanna thank you for the work that you're doing within our communities to help revitalize and stabilize our communities in a way where they now look like gardens of Eden. That's what's most important. And so thank you for tuning in our Money Monday audience for another segment of Money Mondays, where we bring you up to date money news for your personal finances and businesses. As you are listening, I pray that you would listen to this segment over and over again. What James has provided for us are words of wisdom. And as the Bible says, when wisdom come forth, no man can gain through or resist what God has poured forth today. And so we pray that this podcast has blessed you. I'm your host, Jill Thompson, and I look forward to seeing you prosper in this year of glory. Have a great day, everybody.